Hi, everyone, and welcome to Design TV by Sandow, Product Live with Metropolis. I'm Avi Rajagopal, Editor-in-Chief of Metropolis, and today we're going to talk about Brentano's beautiful new wall coverings line. To talk about that with us today is Iris Wong, Founder and Artistic Director of Brentano. Iris, such a pleasure to have you on today. Well, same here, Avi. It's very nice to be here. So, Iris, um, you have over 2,000 textiles in your collection among your offerings. What inspired you to introduce wall coverings? Well, I have been thinking about it for a long time. And uh, now I feel like I know how to design textile. So it's time for me to challenge myself with wall covering. And we happen to have enough uh, staff now. We hired more. So we have a good team to really learn how to do wall covering. So that kind of inspired me to go ahead with it uh, for wall covering. Iris, I know you have a really amazing design process. We're always inspired by how uh, you take us from inspiration to textiles. Tell us a little bit about the inspirations behind the new wall coverings, um, you know, the artistic or cultural influences that led you to create these beautiful new products? Well, um, we are doing what people are asking for. So when I go around and show our fabrics, uh, people will ask us, oh, this would make a beautiful wall covering. Or they will say, why don't you do wall covering? You have so many beautiful patterns. So I sort of follow the people's suggestion in a way. Although I have always wanted to challenge myself one step further from textile to, because that, that's the next thing I can think of. Although there's also area rugs, but wall covering uh, now is, is good. So, so what we did is for the first collection, we used all of our existing fabrics as an inspiration. Although you have to do quite a lot of changes, but um, we, we started with our textile, although that doesn't mean we're not going to do new design. And in fact, the wall covering could then become the inspiration for textile also. So I really love the idea of being able to uh, sort of do both things with one idea. So yeah, uh, the first collection especially is all from our existing fabric, except one actually. Yes or no, it's not exactly the same, but it's the same idea, which is the Celeste that has this big, almost like a soft pebble. You can consider that like a shadow or consider that seeing the pebble stone underwater. Uh, that we had actually a pattern called the Dorado in our line has, a, has that idea, but the image wise is quite different. But otherwise, uh, we continue to get inspired from our fabrics for the coming uh, continuously and coming collection also. So it's really co connected to uh, our textile. Iris, when you're designing a wall covering, you know, you're taking an inspiration from a textile from your collection, you're turning it into wall covering. Um, what is that process like? What are some of the things you have to keep in mind um, that are different with wall coverings compared to textiles? Definitely. Um, in textile, you worry about the warp and the weft and the weaving structures and all that. And for wall coverings, you need to uh, worry about layers, like first, the second, and third layer. Um, in most of the designers understand is how many paths uh, this is. And the more layer you have, the more expensive it is. So in the layers is where you get the subtlety of the fabric. And we usually do at least three layers to make sure that we have this very rich texture and color and yet very, very subtle. So when we transfer a textile into a wall covering, uh, we need to change the thought process. So instead of weaving, when we create a color, instead of a color made by warp and weft, here in wall covering is to the colors made by layers. So that is the big difference that we have to learn. But it was a good learning experience. Now we got it. <laughs> you know, I love, because you went from textiles to wall coverings and you kind of made that connection. Um, of course, now designers have a lot of coordinated products that they could use. You know, when you 
pick a wall covering from your new wall coverings line, Brentano also has a coordinated textile that kind of goes with that, right? Right. Um, can you give us an example of that? Um, you know, perhaps Andromeda, Olympia go together. So like, can yeah. you give us an example of some of the products that kind of coordinate? Yeah, so this is uh, the one that's showing on the screen is uh, Andromeda. Um, and then the fabric name is uh, Olympia. These two patterns are probably the most um, the closest to each other in terms of the image, although we still have to do change in the image to make the repeat and all that. Um, we actually do have a lot of textures that is inspired by fabrics that, um, so in an idea like you're having some kind of a fabric on the wall, uh, but we just mainly focus on beautiful texture. So one of the uh, pattern called the Manderly in fabric, which in the screen right here would be the Chateau. So that fabric has uh, a lot of like a slop yarns and we were able to create that slop yarn with a metallic yarn coming out. So you have a little accent, but you definitely see the weave structure. So these are the things that we have a lot of fun changing and, and make it into a wall covering. So we are actually very much into uh, converting some of our weaving structure into a textile. So um, yeah, so fabric to wall covering has been really a blessing for us. We have endless uh, inspirations from our fabric. Although like the one that we just, you just show on the, on the screen um, is actually my painting. So it also is becoming a great outlet for my painting background. So I intend to do a lot of painting. So this is the hikari, um, it means light. Um, so it's uh, coming from the aura collection that intend to have a very soft edge. We call it like a broken edge. So instead of a very sharp edges, we've done a lot of geometric. So I, I have a flavor to do some soft edges. So. Iris, you and your studio always have such, such a beautiful artistic perspective. I mean, just when I look at the range in this wall coverings line, I mean, you know, we have some that are uh, more to do with texture, as you just described, some that have, you know, patterns derived from nature, you know, stone patterns and things like that. And then, of course, things that derive from your uh, artistic works, which are always so spectacular. Um, and that just gives this wall covering line so much depth and so much range. It's really fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, but I know that you balance that with, you know, the materials and the performance of the product as well. Um, you talked about the different layers and wall covering. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the kind of composition of these wall covering products and what designers should know when they specify them? Um, for we produce right now all type two vinyl. Um, most of designers are very familiar with type two vinyl. Maybe you have to make sure specify it's a type two instead of a type one, which is more durable. Other than that, it's quite well known construction. And that is one of the reasons we started with type two vinyl because it's really performance based. Um, it has a lot more limits in terms of how you can do the service compared to like a grass cloth and all that, which has more of a naturalistic texture and all that. So when you do vinyl, it's got a lot of limitation, but for the purpose of a performance, um, we decided to start with a, a type two vinyl. And I hope in the future we get into other uh, material, by then we will still be paying attention to performance, how well it's maintained, how easy it's used and all that. We will still pay attention to that. That's fantastic. You know, um, these, these wall coverings being, having so much aesthetic uh, range and diversity, so lots of choices, uh, but they're all, as you said, type two vinyl, so high performing and phthalate free again. So you know, um, responsible use of the material as well. Um, are there any, is there anything else about this collection of wall coverings that you'd like to share with designers who might be interested in specifying them? Um, whether it's, you know, certain highlights from the collection or any further information that you think designers should know? Well, we are, like I said, I like to challenge myself in terms of 
things that we've never done. So the coming collection, we're thinking of doing a mural, uh, three panel murals uh, using painting. And we, our whole studio literally sitting there, it was also inspired by one of our woven fabric, like a tapestry looking. It's not a real tapestry weave, but it has that multicolor scenery. And we, our studio literally sitting there and wove the whole pattern on, on the screen, on our, uh, on our uh, uh, Photoshop. So that was a really, really, you can almost say painstaking experience, but we can, it, by doing that, we have freedom to do any color we want. So it was worth the effort for like a whole month, four people sitting in our uh, studio working on the Photoshop. It's still going on, but I am really looking forward to see the result of this beautiful uh, mural that uh, we spend so much effort on. So that will be something I think exciting to share. Absolutely. Well, we are looking forward to it too now. Um, you always push the boundaries, whether it's with your textiles or with your wall coverings, and now you have a new mural product. We're so excited to see everything that comes out from Brentano. Uh, to all the designers who are joining us today, um, if you'd like to find out more about Brentano's offerings, including their wonderful new wall coverings line, please head on over to brentanofabrics.com. That's brentanofabrics.com. Iris, such a pleasure to have you on with us today um, and to hear a little bit behind the scenes of the kind of effort and thinking that goes behind your new product offerings. Thank you so much. We're so excited about this wall coverings line. Thank you so much for interview. Appreciate it. Hi everyone, and welcome to Product Live with Metropolis on Design TV by Sandow. I'm Avi Rajagopal, and today we're gonna to talk about an amazing new material option from Wilson Art, the world leading engineered surfaces company. Joining me today to talk about Thinscape is Ricky Crow, who's vice president of product management for high pressure laminates at Wilson Art. Ricky, such a pleasure to have you with me today. Hey, thank you so much. It's an exciting time to be here and talk about a great new product, Thinscape, today. Wonderful. So, Ricky, um, this new innovation, Thinscape, is really a revolutionary option for countertops and almost any other place where one might use slab-based materials. Can you give us a brief introduction to Thinscape? Sure. Uh, so Thinscape is a new entrant to the surfacing category. And really what it is, is it is an engineered composite slab that really does a great job of combining design, high-end design, with outstanding performance and with a nice uh, eco story as well. So we're excited about this new entrance to the material category. Sounds amazing. Let's dive a little deeper. So first of all, how does Thinscape compare with laminates or other conventional surface materials? What distinguishes it? Well, if you think about materials, you know, something like a laminate is more like a thin product that gets put onto a board with glue, and that's how that's made. If you look at other products in that category, you have things like granite, quartz, butcher block, things like that. Those are more what we would call slab products. So those are, are structural products in the fact that they don't get bonded to anything. And that's really what Thinscape is. Thinscape is a slab product. Now, the cool thing about Thinscape is it's a little bit thinner than most other products. It's about half inch thick. And really that's a that's a key feature because as you start looking at designs and the way that cabinetry is changing, you're starting to see more thinner profile materials being used because they just have a nice cleaner look, especially whenever you look at European style cabinets. Now, just because it's thin though, doesn't mean that it lacks in performance. You know, sometimes people equate thickness with being better. And boy, wouldn't that be great if it was that way in life, right? We'd all be a lot happier. But in this case, this thinner product really performs at a high level. In fact, that's really where Thinscape stands out in areas like impact resistance, heat resistance, and stain resistance. That ability to withstand life and being lived on and being fabricated is really where this product stands out in a big way. The other thing I would say about it is unlike some products like granites, as an example, or other materials, 
it doesn't require any uh, additional maintenance and upkeep. You don't have to seal it. You can just clean it with just household cleaners. So it's a very uh, easy product to live with, we like to say. That sounds fantastic. So it's thinner, so which I think assume we can assume means it's lighter, um, it's durable, and it's easy to maintain, which is incredible. And at least from what we're seeing now, there's a whole range of design options available, right? Yeah, that's something that's really cool about this material. You know, one of the things we talk about, Avi, is that whenever you look at some materials, like a marble can just be a marble. A granite can only be a granite. A wood can only be a wood. Uh, the nice thing about Thinscape is Thinscape can really uh, emulate a lot of different materials. So we have a nice collection of marbles. We have a nice collection of quartz, soapstone. We even have looks that look like aged metal and wood grain looks as well. So really, this really allows you to bring a high performing product into your space that has a wide variety of very high end looks. So will Thinscape stand up to kind of, to the really, you know, high density, high traffic use um, that we might see in commercial spaces? Like, um, is it good for office or hospitality locations? It's great for that, Avi. In fact, you know, if you think about Thinscape, Thinscape really uh, is is a more of an industrial uh, platform, if you will. It's built, if you want to think about like a car analogy, it's built on the chassis of an industrial product. So it is made to be in high traffic, high impact areas. So it's great in commercial, you know, things like tabletops, which you see here, that's a great application for it. Uh, also places like desk, and then any type of worktop or countertop that you might have. Maybe it's at a convenience store where the drink uh, fountains are. Maybe it's in a hotel in a common area where you're serving breakfast. All great applications for Thinscape. And of course, on the residential side, uh, it's wonderful for kitchen countertops, bathroom vanities, or even laundry rooms, or or even garage applications, Avi, where you might get a little bit more wear and tear there. Wow, um, that's amazing. That's a real that's real range, you know. And especially when we look at some of these tabletop applications, I mean, you can just see how thin that material is. Um, and then think about that same material uh, being applicable in a kind of rough and ready garage type situation as well. That's that's fantastic. I mean, this material does it all. Um, there's also, as you mentioned, um, a, a sustainability story to Thinscape. Um, it it is more responsible for the environment and it saves time and labor as well. Can you talk about that? Yeah, sure. So on the sustainability side, you know, one of the things, Avi, this is actually made, it is a paper-based material. So although it is a very rugged, strong composite material, it's made of paper and this paper comes from fast growth forest. So it's something that's intended to be replenished. And so it's a, it's a much better story than taking things out of the earth that aren't going to be replaced. So we really like that. The other thing, there's some other things as well, uh, things like multiple sheet sizes so that you eliminate waste uh, because, you know, you don't want to over order this and then have a lot that you have to throw away. And on that note, unlike a lot of other surfaces where you have what we would call lot control, in other words, if you if you buy something, you have to use it at that time. You can't use it six months later with new material because it doesn't necessarily match. This product has no lot control. So if you have some left over and you have another job that comes down the line, you can order additional material if you need it. It'll be a match and you, you avoid the waste there. So that's really kind of the sustainability story. As far as the time savings, you know, this really, uh, because it's made in a thin profile, it doesn't require any polishing on the surface. So there's a lot of labor savings there and time savings. The other thing is that you don't build down the edge. A lot of countertops, you actually stack and build down the edge to make it seem like it's thicker. And that takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of manpower to do that. This product doesn't require that. So it just stands alone. So it allows people to fabricate it much more quickly on CNC equipment. They can do it by hand. It fabricates with hand tools, but it's really a lot easier to work with than a lot of other materials. And you can really get it through your shop quicker. I mean, uh, what's not to like about Thinscape? It's incredible. There's just so many options available. It's durable, high performing, sustainable. Um, cost saving, time saving. It's just fantastic. Um, is there anything else designers should know when they're considering specifying Thinscape? 
Yeah, I think there's a couple of key things, especially in this time that we're living in right now uh, with logistics challenges and material shortages and things like that. The great thing about Thinscape is it is made in North America. Uh, we make that right in North Carolina. And so we have that locally made and we also have it locally available in stock at our distribution centers all over North America. So, you know, you can specify this product with confidence and know that you're not going to have an issue uh, whenever it comes time to deliver the product with the material showing up, because as Wilson Art has long been a reliable supplier, and this is just another one of our great engineered surfaces that we're excited to bring to the market and uh, serve the, you know, serve that market need. That's absolutely fantastic. To everyone who's joining us today, if you want to know more about Thinscape, head on over to wilsonart.com. That's wilsonart.com for more details. Thank you so much, Ricky, for joining us today. This has been a fantastic conversation, and I'm so excited about this new solution for surfaces. Yeah, we are too, Avi. And again, uh, we look forward to rolling this out further and uh, putting some great new looks in uh, the homes and commercial applications all over the country. Sounds fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been wonderful talking to you. Thanks a lot. Hi everyone, and welcome to Product Live with Metropolis on Design TV by Sandow. In today's segment, we're gonna talk about a beautiful new seating collection from Leland, designed by Altair Tazile Park. Joining me today are the designers, Delphine Tazile and Dennis Park from Altair Tazile Park, joining me today from Barcelona. Dennis and Delphine, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, hi. Thank you. Hi. So we're here to talk about the Gemma collection. It is a big, versatile collection, lots of beautiful finishes, materials, options, uh, and a real connection to how we use space today. Can you give us a small introduction to Gemma and what all the different pieces are that are included in the collection? Yeah, um, we, we started with a chair, um, actually. So there are three main parts of the collection. We started with a chair. Uh, that kind of has a soft pedal gesture, very open and welcoming. welcoming. Um, and it has sort of an architectural arc. It invites people to sit down. Um, and this chair has a couple of different options in terms of the bases. So you can either have the plywood leg, as I think we see here in the image. Uh, there's also a sled version, which is a little bit more economical and um, perhaps a little bit more contemporary contract versus the first one, which would be a little bit warmer, more modernist feel to it. Uh, and then in addition to the chair, we have uh, side tables. Uh, so those come again, different heights. So either for a lounge at a low height or for maybe like a work, a soft work application, a mid height chair, uh, a side table that goes with the chair. Uh, and then there's also a height adjustable option for the table. So we have the chairs, the tables, and then finally we had it added a um, sort of soft upholstered lounge chair. Uh, as we can see here in this image, um, it's sort of more like a cousin than a sibling exactly to the chair. So it's a little bit more volumetric, uh, but at the same time softer, uh, and it gives us an opportunity to sort of extend the collection into lounge spaces. Really beautiful collection. And, you know, I can already see how absolutely versatile it is. You know, wood is such an important part of this Gemma collection whether it's the birch or the, the color finishes with the birch, uh, the walnut or the oak. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you incorporated wood into this collection? Um, yes, so um, I think probably the first thing to mention would be that our view as designers um, is really that our role is to interpret and build on the, on the brand's character. So in this sense, wood has always been an important part of Leland's tradition. Uh, especially in bent ply. They're also very specialized in doing finishing of the wood. So that's kind of something that we want to build on with this collection. Uh, and then finally, just from a design perspective, wood communicates with um, nature, communicates a certain amount of warmth. Uh, it's very human in terms of a, a material as opposed to plastic. So these were aspects that are important in terms of the design. 
Um, and then I would say more specifically in terms of the wood options that we're offering. So there is sort of an oak finish, uh, which gives us an option that's a bit more contemporary, uh, fresh, natural, maybe Scandinavian, if you will. Uh, I think there's a really nice finish, particularly which is um, a brushed uh, oak with a black uh, stain on it that very feels very, uh, I don't know how we say in English, I'm sort of losing my English. So um, material. Uh, haptic, you can really maybe. haptic, you can really see the texture. Uh, and then we also have a walnut option, which is a little bit more conservative, elegant, uh, and also connects with sort of mid-century American furniture. So those are the aspects of those finishes that are important. And then finally, uh, there is a birch uh, wood option, which in terms of um, wood finish, the nice thing about birch is it's very neutral in terms of this color. So it allows us to really apply a lot of different colors uh, that Leland is known for. And I know that there's a few other um, options available here as well, especially with color uh, and some optional upholstery. Uh, do you want to talk about how designers can um, customize or kind of almost um, create within this collection when they're applying it to a project? Uh, right, so we, we just mentioned a little bit about the oak and the walnut options, which are more natural feeling woods. But then, of course, if we switch into the birch option, uh, we really have a large uh, palette of colors that we can work with. We wanted the new colors to really be in the continuity of the old ones. Uh, but adding, uh, as uh, Denis said, just a little layer of complexity, maybe, moving the colors to something a bit more natural. And in that sense, that's why it was also important for us to, to see the veneer. Uh, so to not uh, hide completely the, the grain of the wood. You talked a little bit about building on Leland's legacy here. Um, you mentioned mid-century, you mentioned wood. Um, can you talk a, talk a bit about those early conversations with Leland about how this collection would um, sort of build on the legacy of that brand? Right. That was um, work that we had started maybe two or three years ago in terms of really trying to um, help them concentrate and focus on what we wanted to maintain in the brand going forward. So I think Leland has always had a rich tradition in those, those aspects, right? Being in Michigan, they're very close to uh, the modernist mid-century uh, history that we have uh, in America. And so that was one of the important aspects that we wanted to maintain the company in terms of uh, although I'm based in Europe, I was uh, born in the States, I'm American, and we think it was really interesting uh, for Leland to be able to offer, um, I guess, a different point of view. Rather than importing directly European furniture, uh, we wanted uh, Leland's collections to have a more American point of view, but of course, with a global out, uh, I don't know, outlook or perspective in such a way that we sort of incorporate uh, European aspects, European details, but with a slightly American point of view. So it's sort of local and global, as we've noted here. Um, and I think the other thing that we find about Leland is that it's really a brand that exudes a certain amount of, of optimism, uh, good natured personality. Uh, fresh, yeah. fresh and direct. No? Yeah, exactly. I think very fresh. Uh, and the, the team behind the brand is also very welcoming. So we think that the design should really reflect uh, those values and characteristics. And so I think that's what we've really tried to do with the Gemma Chair is um, physically manifest those values uh, into a form. Gemma is also extremely functional, as we see here, um, with an integration of technology. Can you talk a little bit about that in terms of how you see um, power, data, uh, you know, all of the all of the new things that we now require our furniture to do uh, integrated into the thinking behind Gemma. Yeah, actually I would um, probably note that I think for us, technology is incorporated into the collection in, in more than one way. So probably first off a little bit more subtly uh, is in terms of the manufacturing. So I think from a design studio perspective, we're always interested in, in how can technology serve uh the users uh, and so in that sense technology here has been used to really be able to manufacture soft surfaces haptic surfaces in a way that's not so common and probably stretching the technical technical capacity of plywood to its limits 
So that's probably one way that's a little bit integrated, but we won't see it directly. And then secondly, we obviously tried to incorporate um, more electrification in terms of uh, the Gemma totem table. So you can, you can see here in the image, we can incorporate a USB uh, port. Uh, and also in terms of the accessories with the height adjustable table, uh, so those are additional layers on top of the aesthetic part that we think are very useful uh, to helping interior designs uh, designers um, incorporate Gemma into their spaces. Really, there's so many layers to this um, beautiful collection, Dennis and Delphine. Um, really, congratulations on on having conceived of of such a a beautiful solution for spaces today. Is there anything else that you think interior designers who might be interested in using the Gemma collection should know or should pay attention to, should think about um, how it can connect to the spaces that they're designing today? Uh, right, I think probably in, in two aspects. So I think first of all, mm, I think really Gemma as a, as a family um, reflects versatility um and really design as a process and a focus sort of more on culture as a product so we really tried to hard as we mentioned before to incorporate values in the forms in terms of the pedal like gesture it's very friendly um you know it's very contemporary but almost maybe shaker like in terms of its simplicity uh but at the same time it's not simple i mean there's a lot of rich details uh, as we mentioned earlier, the haptic soft surfaces on everywhere you can touch in terms of the edges to the chair seat, the waterfall front. So we tried to really build a lot of layers or frequencies where people can connect to the design. Uh, and I think it's really full of contrast. The collection has a lot of balanced contrast you know, in terms of being something that's friendly, but not simple. Just to, to add that it's this balance to be um, not uh, expected, let's say, like special but very easy at the same time so you, it's like easy to f to fall in love no it, because it's special it's a bit cultural mm. uh, but also you, you feel nearly that uh, you already know it this collection is really remarkable in that aspect is the balance it strikes between as you were saying Delphine being something special but something accessible um, as you're saying Dennis that you know between um, mediating between sort of the space and the body, but also working across different kinds of spaces. It's just a fantastic collection. There's so much to explore in this collection. There's so many details for designers to um, delve into and um, so many options and so many um, possibilities that designers can generate as they're using Gemma in their spaces. Thank you so much, Dennis and Delphine, for joining me for this conversation and congratulations on a beautiful collection. And to all the designers who are joining us today, if you want to know more about the Gemma collection, head on over to lelandfurniture.com. That's L-E-L-A-N-D furniture.com uh, for more details on Gemma. Uh, I do hope to see Gemma in lots of lovely spaces um, in the coming years. Thank you so much for creating this really versatile, almost timeless collection. It's a real pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. Thanks.